Whey protein has scientifically been known to be an amazing supplement for both weightlifters and athletes, but the latest research is now showing that it can also be the secret to losing weight faster, becoming healthier, and even living longer. So could it do the same for you? While whey protein is arguably tied for the top spot of the fitness supplementation pyramid next to creatine, new studies like these continue to come out comparing it to other types of protein supplements along with its health effects to people outside of the gym. So is it still on top? Well, in this video, we're going to cover not just the results of that study, but we'll also give you the one-on-one -on, -one on everything you need to know about this supplement, its impacts to not just exercise and fitness, but also the new science on its effects on weight loss, health, and longevity. So let's get cracking and weigh in on the science of whey protein. First and most importantly, from a first principles perspective, we need to be on the same page with the basics. When we talk about protein, it's not a single thing, but a category of things, just like vitamins aren't a single thing. Protein is a macronutrient umbrella that describes over 500 different building blocks of life that we know of. But luckily, only 20 of which are actually found in the human body. When we say protein intake, it means the intake of all 20 of these proteins as one general idea. And many content creators avoid talking about this in detail because it can sometimes be overwhelming, but it's important to realize that optimal protein intake ensures that you not just have enough protein, but that you have the right balance of the baseline requirements of every single one of these amino acids. To me, it's just as ineffective as saying you need vitamins in your body and never talk about actually which vitamins you need. That being said, it's not actually as bad as that when it comes to protein since most dietary protein sources and even supplements are groups of these amino acids, just in varying quantities, otherwise called their amino acid profile. We'll be doing a deep dive into the latest research across each of these amino acids in the future, so let us know in the comments below if there's a specific amino acid you want us to focus on first, and like and subscribe to the channel to stay up to date when those videos come out. Some of these amino acids your body can make from other proteins, which is why they used to be divided into two categories, essential and non-essential. Essential, describing the amino acids your body has to get from external dietary sources, and non-essential, describing amino acids that your body can technically make on its own from other amino acids. However, this started shifting in the early 2000s based on studies in the Journal of Nutrition classifying some non-essential amino acids as conditionally essential amino acids, since they were found to be indispensable for overall health and because based on the general sample of the population, found that it wasn't actually being made in sufficient amounts for optimum health for the majority of people. So where does whey come into play? Whey protein is one of the two high quality proteins derived from cow's milk casein being the other. And when I say high quality, it's not just marketing puffery, but a technical term describing the diversity of its amino acid profile as a protein source, and specifically all of the essential amino acids your body needs. Meaning whey protein is comprised of virtually all 20 amino acids in varying amounts. Which makes sense because these are the proteins that a newborn baby calf would need in order to grow. The alternative are proteins that are missing one or more of these essential amino acids, which, unfortunately for vegans, are usually plant-based proteins, with few exceptions like soy and quinoa. As a side note, as I was researching this, I got curious and wondered where herbivores like cows actually get their protein intake from. The reason cows chew cud or any other herbivores is that rumen, or where plant food gets digested in their four stomachs, has a microbiome that consists of rumen bacteria that eat and break down the grass and hay that omnivores or carnivores can't digest. And those microbes are actually what the cow digests itself to supply 60 to 75% of its protein requirements, in addition to byproducts the microbes create in the form of fat. This means that the phytonutrients in plants that we can't digest also become part of that protein mix that the bacteria is feeding on when it's converted into a cow or any herbivore's proteins like mussels or milk, which lend support to the claim that grass-fed products are actually healthier than grain-fed. Otherwise, whey protein is a byproduct of cheese making. When a coagulant, usually rennet, is added to milk, your curds or casein proteins and whey separate and whey protein is the water-soluble part of milk. In order to make whey protein that we see in our protein powders, milk is boiled to get pasteurized and then cooled to four degrees. After this pasteurization, the milk is 20% whey and 80% casein by weight. 
The milk is filled with a naturally occurring enzyme that separates the whey from the casein, and you then end up with a liquid and a solid, something that looks a little bit like cottage cheese. The liquid is then purified to remove fat and water, and what's left is then loaded into a large turbine, dried with hot and cold air, to remove any remaining water and separate any solids from the liquid. The resulting powder is 80 to 90% protein, which results in the two main types of whey protein, whey concentrate and whey isolate. Other whey products like hydrosilates are usually further processed and cost more, but so far very little evidence has shown efficacy in those types compared to just whey isolate. So to compare, whey protein concentrate is the least pure form of protein powder you'll find on the shelves, with 80% protein and a mix of 20% fat and carbohydrates, usually in the form of lactose, which, yes, is not friendly for the lactose intolerant ones like me. Whey protein isolate, though, is generally the purest commercially available form and typically contains less than 10% fat and carbs, the highest quality versions of which have virtually zero fat and carbs, which means it's safe for the lactose intolerant. It's super important to have a high quality and third-party lab tested supplier so you don't get concentrate being passed off as isolate. Not to mention a 2018 report in protein powders finding that of the 134 brands they tested off the shelf, over 70% of them had detectable levels of lead and cadmium. That's why I partnered with Canadian Protein for this video, my personal protein and supplement source since 2015, primarily because they're both third-party lab tested and certified. I'll get to them later in the video or check them out in the description. So how much protein does your body actually need? This argument has been raging in the fitness world for decades, but frankly, protein requirements differ depending on your age, your sex, activity level, and a multitude of other factors. But the general consensus in the fitness community is that most adults should be consuming two grams of protein per one kilogram of body mass or one gram per pound. To note, this means pure protein. So just to be clear, if you're tracking macros as an example, when you weigh out 100 grams of chicken breast, you're only consuming 31 grams of protein on average, the rest usually being fat and water. Personally, I like Peter Atiyah's method of doing a height-based approach of one gram per centimeter of height for my clients, which eliminates the variability of how lean or obese you are, especially if you're doing weight loss and you're overweight or obese. With more studies showing the importance of retaining or improving the amount of lean muscle mass you have as you age, this advice extends even to people who aren't trying to get a bodybuilding physique and simply an insurance policy to improving your health, fitness, and longevity. And of course, you don't need to supplement to achieve your daily protein intake goals. Protein can come entirely from whole foods or from a combination of whole foods and protein supplements. However, protein powders can be a more convenient, better measurable and more consistent way to get more protein, not to mention gram for gram, as I mentioned, it's usually a lot cheaper for the same or better quality as what you can find from food-based proteins. On the flip side, some people are afraid of protein intake because they think too much whey protein can damage your kidneys. Rest assured that eating too much protein is probably unlikely to be a problem for the vast majority of people. According to Peter Atiyah's research, a person would need to consume anywhere from 3 to 4 grams per kilogram or 6 to 8 grams per pound, which is 6 to 8 times the recommended dose I had mentioned before you would ever start challenging your kidney's ability to excrete the excess nitrogen, which is the main concern with increased protein intake. Not to mention for the most part, the data overwhelmingly suggests that a deficit of protein consumption is the most likely cause for people's health issues, particularly for middle-aged women and those who don't have a normal balanced diet. So what happens when you do take sufficient amounts of protein? Well, there has been a heavy amount of research done on whey protein over the past several decades. And of course, while some of these studies are funded by people who sell or manufacture protein supplements, others are funded by nutrition and athletic performance labs. So there's definitely enough unbiased research to go on, like this meta-analysis in 2017 in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, stating, quote, Protein supplementation significantly enhanced changes in muscle strength and size during prolonged resistance exercise in healthy adults. Increasing age reduces, while training experience increases, the efficacy of protein supplementation during resistance exercise, which suggests older individuals may need more protein intake in order to achieve the same benefits, while the more you train, the better your body becomes at using the amino acids you're putting into your body. 
And indeed, weightlifters and athletes are usually seen as the biggest beneficiaries of whey protein benefits since it's backed up by research as the most well-absorbed and fast-digesting protein source, specifically with a high concentration of the amino acid leucine. When paired with resistance training, it limits muscle loss during both calorie deficits and aging, while also modestly limiting fat gain during periods of bulking. In fact, much of the research has been focused on that amino acid, leucine, which is found in high concentrations in whey protein, which again makes sense given what milk is supposed to do in infants, which is grow. This is the amino acid most highly correlated in research to increase muscle protein synthesis or building and maintaining lean muscle mass. Because of its high concentration of leucine and its resistance to coagulating in your stomach, it's far more potent at stimulating protein synthesis compared to other protein types, including even lean dietary sourced proteins like tuna, turkey, and eggs, which are much slower digesting. But lastly, on that note, unlike a lot of bro science videos you might see of what some call the anabolic window, research has consistently shown as far back as 2013 that as long as your daily protein intake is met, the timing on when you consume your protein, whether it's before, during, or after your workout, has very little to no effect on its effectiveness to improve muscle strength and protein synthesis. However, new studies have recently come out that timing protein relative to sleep is gaining evidence for health benefits. So subscribe to the channel, give us a like, and pop a comment below if you want us to research that and make a supplement science video on that in the future. While there's a significant body of evidence to support health and performance in a fitness sense, the same research also supports its use for the general population when it comes to health and longevity and even weight loss. The vast majority of people simply don't get enough protein from diets, whether it's due to cost or convenience, even when the research on the importance of lean muscle mass for health as you age is very compelling. The same muscle building and sparing benefits in fitness are just as, if not more helpful, especially if you're cutting with a fasted protocol or doing intermittent fasting. Beyond that, health benefits are consistently being found in modern research from 2020 to 2022, showing that supplementing whey protein may benefit blood pressure, endothelial function, and even appears to improve several glycemic and lipid-related biomarkers in adults with type 2 diabetes and even other metabolic conditions. The big caveat here is that there is conflicting research when it comes to longevity science. While research on improving lean muscle shows that the benefits of supporting health and longevity as you age, longevity studies in animals show that the mechanisms of any protein metabolism, namely mechanisms related to mTOR, are correlated with lower lifespans. Now personally, and I'll put the big disclaimer here that this is now the realm of my opinion, Based on both my research on fasting and autophagy, as well as fitness science, it's a very compelling idea that there seems to be a need for the balance of both growth mechanisms like protein synthesis to maintain healthy physiological functioning, alongside breakdown mechanisms like autophagy through fasting to fix cellular damage like senescent cells which causes cellular diseases to take root. You can check out my overview of the autophagy research over here. All that said, for the most part, the evidence still shows that for the immediate short-term and even medium-term benefits from health, muscle synthesis, and even weight loss, sufficient protein intake is a significant factor in being able to achieve your personal health, weight loss, and fitness goals. So lastly, as you try to find the right kind of protein for your requirements, several factors are at play. Whey protein is obviously what we're talking about here, but the research continues to pour in as whey protein isolate currently sits on top as the king of the best protein supplement available in the market. But as with the study we highlighted in the introduction, proteins are commonly compared to their efficacy to each other, especially those comparing whey to what's considered sustainable or ethical plant-based sources, and even now to insect-based protein. As it happens, that study I mentioned in our intro in Denmark that just got published this month compared the muscular metabolic changes in 52 young males between whey protein, pea protein, and cricket protein, used magnetic resonance imaging to track the amount of metabolites in the blood, showing what amino acids were actually being used after performing resistance leg exercises. They found that the muscle concentrations of important amino acids, namely leucine, methionine, glutamate, and myonositol, were higher after the intake of whey protein compared to both cricket and pea protein. It also showed, interestingly, a faster transition into a more ketogenic direction, which can be seen as a sign of a higher energy or glycogen consumption, 
which also leads to the indications of higher levels of autophagy and a transition to fat loss when paired with resistance exercise. That said, many people choose to consume non-animal-based proteins for reasons beyond optimal function, which is why I partner with Canadian Protein for this and many of my other videos, since they have a range of both vegan and non-vegan options. I've personally been using them, as I mentioned, since 2015 because they're the highest quality brand I could find in North America, especially being consistently third-party lab tested and globally certified across all of their supplements, not just protein. I personally use their sugar-free grass-fed New Zealand whey isolate, but they have a wide variety including sweetened and completely unflavored versions if you don't want any additives at all, as well as vegan options like brown rice, soy, or pea proteins. They also sell in bulk, so you can get prices similar to or even cheaper than Costco or Amazon, and personally, I find they taste even better than Optimum or Premier that I used to get from Costco back in the day. Now, since the large majority of you watching this video, 40% at last count, is from the US, rest assured they do have free shipping options to both Canada and the US as well, so you can enjoy the rigorous supplement quality that we enjoy here up north. As a rehash fitness viewer, you can also get 15% off your order. Just check out the description below and use my personal link to help support the research we do on this channel while getting incredibly high quality supplements. So let us know in the comments below if you have any questions about whey protein or any other supplement. And I'm also curious if you're watching this, have you been able to meet your protein intake consistently au naturel through just your diet? Also, if you like this kind of content and want to stay up to date with the latest research, a like and subscribe would go a really long way to support the channel. Otherwise, check out this playlist to see some of the other supplement science episodes on our channel so far to support your own fitness, health, and longevity journey. This is Joe signing out, and as always, stay curious, stay healthy, and stay happy, and I'll see you all in the next one.